All those who are holding tickets outside will get in as fast as they can. I'm speaking out to you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm speaking to the crowd on the outside who seem to be standing rather reluctant to come in, and we're going to start this very soon. Why so serious? You don't know the power of the dark side. I do wish we could chat for longer, but I'm having an old friend for dinner. A boy's best friend is his mother. Here's Johnny. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. <laughs> we want it. We need it. Must have the precious. They stole it from us. Sneaky little hobbits is wicked, tricksy, false. No, not master. He has precious. It's false. They will cheat you, hurt you, lie. Master is my friend. You don't have any friends. Nobody likes you. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. You're a liar and a thief. (laughs) You mutinous dogs. And welcome back to (laughs) Worthy. This episode, we are talking about the 1935 Best Picture winner, Mutiny on the Bounty, and we just felt that it would be appropriate to start the discussion about villains. And no better way to talk about villains than to read some of the best villain quotes in cinematic history and to poorly uh, mimic their great performances as we just destroyed them with our horrible yeah (laughs) let let us know which ones you liked the best (laughs) i think we know which one won (laughs) and that was me doing it (laughs) definitely the longest one for sure you got the most to chew on here's Uh, johnny is a classic though. yeah here's johnny is a classic and i think okay so now let's really start talking about villains though and i think the first place that we got to start is who's your favorite villain john that's such a hard question because it's like a it's like a balance of of a good villain and a good hero makes a good villain. So I'm gonna go just generally because you didn't ask me in film. So I'm going generally. <laughs> uh, the Joker is my favorite. Obviously, in The Dark Knight, it's kind of defined as one of the best Joker performances. But the, just the duality that Joker has with Batman and this like forever bond and almost romantic relationship that they have together in yeah. a weird disturbing way just makes him a much more compelling villain it's probably one of the most like compelling good guy bad guy uh, dichotomies just because the joker is supposed to this clown and he puts on that happy face whereas batman is the hero but he's the dark depressing one in the relationship yeah so in a weird way he's, they're conflicting yeah. in that kind of sense it plays with like the cat and mouse aspect of their like hero and villainess of it which is what makes it really appealing. And, and then Christopher Nolan obviously took it to, well, and Heath Ledger as well, took it to a completely new level in yeah. uh, The Dark Knight. Yeah, it's a cheating answer because not only can I just say it's outside of film, but it's also like a character that has so many interpretations. So I could just say that like generally that character is my favorite villain, but it could be multitude or combination of the villains that they've portray- portrayed in film, but also have portrayed in like the comics and the animated show. Right. Because Mark Hamill is the best Joker. I'm sorry, Heath Ledger. That's for a whole other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but for this one, let's try and stay on point. Uh, How think, about you, Ben? What's your favorite? Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I, I'm i a really big a Clockwork Orange fan. So I really like Alex DeLarge and Malcolm McDowell's performance of that. But it's a, like he's – when we sort of were talking about this before the podcast, like there are some villains that aren't necessarily villains, but they have that villain role. Like can a protagonist be a villain, you know? Could it? I don't know. Could it? I don't know. It, it's definitely possible, um, which leads me to my next point. But but first, I think, though, my favorite villain is Christoph Waltz in The Glorious Bastards mm. as, as Hans Landa. Classic. Um, but so to bring it to our next point, though, is why is a villain so attractive? There are so many great performances, and especially more recently, where the villain's role, everyone just loves it. And they, they, they wrap themselves around it, and they really dive into you know the the mind and and the thought process to not only uh the character themselves but the actor's method into getting into that role so why do you think that we as an audience are so interested in in villains i think just like in in general film sex and violence are so prominent and powerful tools just because it's like something that we kind of fetishize and want to see even though we never really want to have it portrayed violence in particular like portrayed in real life and seeing that in the same way that we like love a good villain like we love 
usually the antithesis of a villain that's kind of faced with a hero. Like, I don't think many people just love a villain unless that villain has a great enemy. Like, Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader. Like, Darth Vader's awesome and badass, and he's scary when you first see him in the original Star Wars. But without that kind of happy-go-lucky Luke on the other end, that kind of, like, is the opposing, complete opposite force to Darth Vader, we kind of lose some of that. You know, we don't get as much depth into the the villain without uh, a good hero on its side. So what about you, Ben? What do you think? Why do you think that's just so appealing to have villains in stories? I think it ha- it definitely has to do with the an audience's intrigue in sex and violence and horror. Uh, I know personally I'm a huge horror fan. I love when things get gory. I love when things are messy. There's murder. It's it's intriguing to watch, and it, ad- it adds to a lot of tension that I love to see in film because it brings – my own emotion. Well, I wouldn't say my emotions, but it heightens my experience with the film and like taking it in. So it makes me feel like I'm actually there. So a really good performance can, um, in a way freak you out so much that you're like, Oh my God, my stomach is turning. This is like really uncomfortable, but it's, I can't take my eyes away and it's really compelling. And it, it's been recognized a lot by the Oscars. There have been so many performances that have won uh, best actor, best actress, best supporting actor, best supporting actress award, and just to name a few, uh, so we have Harvey, Javier Bardem in No Country for Old Men, Kathy Bates in Misery, Michael Douglas in Wall Street, Louis Fletcher in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Gene Hackman in Unforgiven, Anthony Hopkins in The Signs of the Lambs, Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight, Frederick Marsh in Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde, J.K. Simmons in Whiplash, Christoph Waltz in Inglourious Bastards, and Forrest Whitaker in The Last King of Scotland. Uh, that's a lot of names, and a lot of those performances are iconic in the world of best acting performances if you were to rank them a lot of those are i think up at the top of the top and speaking of more recent ones you know ones like christoph waltz and like jk simmons really jumped out of the screen and they took the um that oscar really by the balls and was like this is mine and you know that year and there was like hands down they were going to get it um so it's definitely recognized by the the voting body for the oscars that villain performances and the anti-heroes are very uh, much embraced in you know the in Hollywood. Well, I think it's all those villains that you just named have one thing in common, and I think in their performance, the one thing that's in common is that they're very loud and aggressive, and every one of those villains yells at one point, if not through the majority of the film. And I think with the Academy, seeing a, a performance that's so heightened and intense is almost kind of deemed as a great performance especially if you can portray that consistently over multiple takes and then consistently throughout a movie once it's finished is a talent in its way Uh, I think that's also like a problem with the academy where a lot of like subtle and small performances get kind of undershadowed because they're not as like big and grandiose as like a villain per se yeah, that's definitely true. That's a, that's a very good point because I I did not think about that. That we tend to pick the performances that are much, that are much more louder and and aggressive compared to some other ones. And at the same time, though, I still don't, don't think it takes away from the villain performances themselves and the ones that already won. It, it is it a a problem maybe, and maybe that has to do with the psychosis of the audiences in general. Maybe also because the voting body for the academy was predominantly you know, straight white men and older white men who just love that, those performances. So we'll see as the years and in the future now, as those go on and see what performances get picked. But it's, I I still think that those villain performances are going to be the ones that stand out the most, just because of Heath Ledger's Joker really that got people into loving it. And it, and it pretty much skyrocketed Joaquin Phoenix's performance as the Joker. Cause I don't think that movie would have been as successful or would have been as recognized as an Academy worthy movie or performance if not for Heath Ledger yeah that's that's definitely possible it's more it's not so like a, a problem because it is very entertaining and it's easy to like look at those those characters and those performances and like want to highlight them and want to show the world that this is like the best performance but on the other hand like I was saying it kind of dwindles on the other side of things where you may miss out on like smaller performances and I always think of the Oscars when they're showing clips in modern Oscar times when they have the full TV show and they're showing like the clip of whatever was nominated or whatever won and it's always like the most intense scene in the movie where they're screaming or yelling because it's like the most engaging and it's usually what you can point at and be like damn he's screaming and really angry like that's good acting 
no one ever points that to a guy who's just really happy and he's portraying happiness really well. And it's like, damn, that's a good performance. <laughs> so it's just an interesting take about how we look at villains and it's so entertaining for us to like digest something that's so otherworldly and just something that you don't see in most of your day to day life. Yeah, I, 100%. Uh, I definitely agree with that. And so now the listeners of this podcast may be wondering, wait, why aren't we talking about the 1935 Best Picture of Mutiny on the Bounty? Well, because that featured Charles Lawton's character, Captain Bly, which I think, and I'm pretty sure John thinks, that is the basis of some of our favorite villains, like Darth Vader, like Nurse Ratchet, like Na- HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's this... I don't want to say grot because he's not grotesque looking, but his personality is grotesque. And watching his performance on on the ship, which ultimately leads to, you know, spoiler alert, the mutiny on the bounty. Um, it's that kind of intensity and his the way he he, he goes about treating the, his underlings and the way he tortures people and thinks punishment is totally okay. It adds to his villainous s s. I don't know. There's too many s's on villainesses. <laughs> but villainosity. <Villainosity. laughs> the the villain the villain quality the evil quality to Charles Lawton's Captain Bly is very prevalent, and so I think like that's why we have to talk about villains to start this conversation. Uh, so, are there any like initial feelings about Charles Lawton's performance as Captain Bly before we get really into a bigger deep dive later on in this podcast? It's definitely the first performance where I've hated it. Not because of the performance, but because of I hated the character so much. Right. And that's a good villain. Yeah, it was so compelling. Well, I don't think that's always a good villain. I think there can be different kinds of villains where this is a villain that doesn't have any bright side. There's no like redeeming quality or really entertaining quality about him other than you just being so angry and wanting the mutiny to happen. So it is a very particular kind of villain in that way where it's not like he's laughing behind the scenes and there's not really an enjoyment to it because it's like these men on this boat are essentially like slaves feeding other slaves, which we'll get into the plot, but yeah, there's no bright side of his like villainous behavior that a lot of other characters. Yeah. And I think that the behavior that he does have has a lot to do with how he treats uh, the Navy or the British. What, what is, what is the (laughs) British army called the Navy Academy or the, the the Royal Royal Naval. Yeah. Anyone who is, from the UK listening to this, I am so sorry. We <laughs> we just don't we don't know the it. The Royal Navy. The Royal right. Navy. Yes, that that sounds right. The Royal Navy. <laughs> but anyways, his like respect towards the Royal Navy um, really adds to like why he feels like I can you know flog people, we can kill haul people uh, in in the realm of the film because that's how we do it in the Navy. And that's that. Like, that's the only reason he needs to have. Yeah, I think there's a little bit more subtext with yeah. uh, Captain Cook, I believe. Yeah, Captain Cook is a previous captain that he worked under, essentially. Yeah. Which we'll get into, like, kind of the plot, but that's just kind of, like, a couple of sidelines are mentioned. And I think that's kind of alluding to his backstory. And supposedly in history, Captain Cook was also a horrible, horrible captain and mistreated his men. So he could have just been on the other side of things, like, in terms of his backstory and getting that bad behavior and wanting to then, you know, the same way a parent was beat as a kid may then beat their child in a weird way. Right. But I think it's time to jump in the film. We're diving into <laughs> these story details. Yeah, and, we are. Uh, I think it's time to jump in and ask that question, Ben. Yeah. So, John, let me ask you that question. Is Mutiny on the Bounty worthy of the 1935 Best Picture Award? <laughs> Mutiny on the Bounty. First mate Fletcher Christian leads a revolt against his sadistic commander, Captain Bly, in this classic seafaring adventure based on the real-life 1788 mutiny. One night in Portsmouth, England, in 1787, a press gang breaks into a local tavern and presses all of the men drinking there into naval service. One of the men inquires as to what ship they will sail on, and the press gang leader informs him that it is HMS Bounty, Upon inquiring as to who the captain is, another man is told the captain is William Bly and attempts to escape. As Bly is a brutal tyrant who routinely administers harsh punishment to officers and crew alike who lack discipline, cause any infraction on board the ship, or defy his authority in any manner. The bounty leaves England several days later on a two-year voyage over the Pacific Ocean. Fletcher Christian, 
played by Clark Gable, the ship's lieutenant, is a formidable yet compassionate man who disapproves of Bly's treatment of the crew. Roger Byam is an idealistic midshipman who is divided between his loyalty to Bly, owing to his family's naval tradition, and his friendship with Christian. During the voyage, the enmity between Christian and Bly grows after Christian openly challenges Bly's unjust practices aboard the ship. When the ship arrives at the island of Tahiti, where the crew acquires breadfruit plants to take to the West Indies, Bly punishes Christian by refusing to let him leave the ship during their stay. Byam, meanwhile, sets up residency on the island and lives with the island chief, Kitihiti, and his daughter, Tahani, and he compiles an English dictionary of the Tahitian language. Kitihiti persuades Bly to allow Christian a day pass on the island. Bly agrees, but quickly repeals the pass out of spike. Christian disregards the order and spends his day off the ship romancing a Tahitian girl, Mamiti. Christian promises her he will be back someday. After leaving Tahiti, the crew begins to talk of mutiny after Bly's harsh discipline leads to the death of the ship's beloved surgeon, Mr. Bacchus. Bly severely cuts water rationing to the crew in favor of providing more water for the breadfruit plants. Christian, although initially opposing the idea, decides he can no longer tolerate Bly's brutality when he witnesses crew members shackled in iron chains and he approves the mutiny. The crew raids the weapons cabin and seizes the ship. Bly and his loyalists are cast into a boat and set adrift at sea with a map and rations to ensure their survival. Due to Bly's steady leadership, they are able to find their way back to land. Meanwhile, Christian orders that bounty return to Tahiti. Byam, who was in his cabin during the mutiny, disapproves of what Christian has done and decides the two can no longer be friends. Months later, Byam is married to Tahani, and Christian is married Maimiti and has a child with her while the rest of the crew are enjoying their freedom on the island. After a long estrangement, Byam and Christian reconcile their friendship. However, when the British ship HMS Pandora is spotted approaching, Byam and Christian decide that they must part ways. Byam and several crew members must remain on the island for the ship to take them back to England, while Christian leads the remaining crew, his wife, and several Tahitian men and women back on board the bounty in search of a new island in which to seek refuge. Byam boards Pandora, and much to his surprise, discovers that Bly is the captain. Bly, who suspects that Byam was complicit in the mutiny, has him in prison for the remainder of the journey across the sea. Back in England, Byam is court-martialed and found guilty of mutiny. Before the court condemns him, Byam speaks of Bly's cruel, dehumanizing conduct aboard Bounty. Due to the intervention of his friend Sir Joseph Banks and Lord Hood, Byam is pardoned by King George III and allowed to resume his naval career at sea. Meanwhile, Christian has found Pitcairn, an uninhabited yet sustainable island that he believes will provide adequate refuge from the reach of the Royal Navy. After Bounty crashes on the rocks, Christian orders her to be burned. Mutiny on the Bounty starred Charles Lawton as Captain Bly, Clark Gable as Fletcher Christian, Franz Schott Tone as Roger Byam, Herbert Munden as Smith, Eddie Quillen as Ellison, Dudley Diggs as Bacchus, and Donald Crisp as Burkett. Mutiny on the Bounty was directed by Frank Lloyd. Produced by Irving Thalberg and Frank Lloyd. Written by Talbot Jennings, Jules Furthman, Carrie Wilson, based on a novel by Charles Nordoff and James Norman Hall. Music by Herbert Stothart. Cinematography by Arthur Edison. Film editing by Margaret Booth. So, Ben, before we kick it off here, the film starts with an opening crawl. Yes. And I just wanted to read it out to us so we can kind of discuss, and I want to hear your thoughts on what you think of this opening crawl. Okay. In December 1787, HMS Bounty lay in Portsmouth Harbor on the eve of departure for Tahiti in the uncharted waters of the Great South Sea. The Bounty's mission was to procure breadfruit trees for transplanting to the West Indies as cheap food for slaves. Neither ship nor breadfruit reached the West Indies. Mutiny prevented it, mutiny against the abuse of harsh 18th century sea law. But this mutiny, famous in history and legend, helped bring about a new discipline based upon mutual respect between officers and men by which Britain's sea power is maintained as security for all who pass upon the seas. So, Ben, what do you think about that opening crawl for Mutiny on the Bounty? Well, there better be a really good mutiny. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it sets up that the story is going to go to a certain place and it prepares you for that. You know, it's historical that, you know, I guess going into it, spoil, like, you know, spoilers galore, like there's supposed to be a mutiny. So you're like prepared mentally for this like mutiny and you kind of expect it to happen pretty quickly into the movie. You expect, especially after that title card, because it feels like that sets up a lot of the, the background so of the much. story. It, it tells it, you the movie. Yeah, like, it tells you the exact plot of the movie, but you don't get that mutiny until what was it hour and 30 minutes into the movie an hour and 30 out of a, a movie that runs like two hours and like 16 minutes. minutes yeah 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 i have a lot of problems with this opening <laughs> crawl because <laughs> it it's just really odd in nature because it not only describes what the whole movie's about yeah the title of the movie is called mutiny on the bounty so we're already understanding that there's gonna be a mutiny you can't really hide that because that's what the whole plot of the film is essentially about but then the entire crawl just opens up and tells you exactly some backstory, which makes sense. And then it tells you how famous of a mutiny this is and that there's going to be a mutiny. But by the title, like we know everything. The only thing we got added information is that they're getting these breadfruit trees to then feed slaves. That's like, the, But they already say that in the movie, too. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. why is any of this even in this movie? Yeah, they already say it in like it's already the title of the movie. And this is based off of a book that came out, I think, three years before that was very popular. Yeah. So it's like everyone kind of knew uh, or had some idea about this. Uh, so it is very just like, why is this necessary? And I think that's just, I, that's just how Hollywood was with how they would set up stories. They like felt like they had to put these title cards in. Yeah. And I think that's a silent film era thing, especially that really sets up the, the whole like world of the film and kind of place you know, instead of a film where you like today, where you just kind of dropped right into it. You are that you're giving all this backstory. You're dropped into it, but the the way you're dropped into is sort of like, well, we just read that, and it kind of makes no sense. And one it's, of the things that you pointed out, I'm going to steal this from you right now, is you said this is like Star Wars, where Star Wars. Yeah, we'll definitely compare this movie to Star Wars a lot. Yeah, where like it's like Star Wars, where it sets it up, but what Star Wars does really well is it drops you right into the action. So it actually, would have been interesting if maybe they dropped us right into the action of the mutiny right after the. Uh, opening uh, title or the opening scrawl, um, if you want to call it, but I, I don't know. I, it it is a little unceremonious with how it happens and then how it plays out after the fact. Yeah, I think if you compare directly to Star Wars, which I I know originally watching a lot of like behind the scenes of the original 1977 Star Wars, that the opening crawl was originally much longer and much more detailed and very like way too overly detailed for like a general audience to like understand and digest the information and it just didn't work and i think some of george lucas's friends told him to like actually cut down and, and i really, think it was brian de palma who yeah told specifically him. de palma i was gonna say yeah. de palma but i was blanking yeah specifically brian de palma tells him to cut it down and really make it more digestible which is funny because it makes so much more sense in Star Wars because it gives you all this backstory because you're set up in this new foreign world and galaxy and you need this general information, but you also need it to be as simple as there's bad guys, there's good guys, and here's where we are, here's boom, is what, like, everything's happened before the story. But this is just saying, like, oh, there's a Death Star and uh, there's a Luke Skywalker who's going to become a Jedi, and, and this is important because he saves the galaxy and he, he blows up the Death Star, so... Get ready. Here, yeah. come, here comes Star Wars. <laughs> it's going to happen. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you put it like that, it, it definitely doesn't. When you're watching the movie, you're necessarily not thinking about it because also you can think of it as a, like, oh, well, I'm getting my popcorn. I'm getting like settled into the movie. And, it, and it's at the beginning. So you, th you don't think about it as much. But then after the fact and now talking about it, it really does make no sense why we are setting up something that we not only explains the whole purpose and the, just the title of the movie, but it was a popular story and it, it was historical enough that people that the MGM felt compelled enough to make a movie out of it. And uh, so, yeah, it is a little unnecessary, but we move on just like the film does into the grand world of the Royal Navy and which features some really interesting characters. And I, the first character we actually get to meet is the previous Best Actor Award winner, Clark Gable, as Fletcher Christian. Um, he, I think the first thing, though, that people will notice right away is his famous mustache is gone. And he is an American playing a British naval officer. 
Uh, so first, John, to kind of, I want to ask this question. How do you feel about old Hollywood and how they would just say, fuck it. We're going to take a, an American man and we're going to make him British and not tell him to use a British accent. And just because he's a big star like Clark Gable. It's really jarring. It's really jarring, especially in this movie, since he the majority of the actors are speaking with like a British accent or are kind of British. It kind of goes in and out yeah. for some characters here and there. But Captain Bly especially is very British. Yeah. And it's it's just so odd seeing Clark Gable. who just feels like he just doesn't fit in almost like George. <laughs> gonna go go back to batman for a second <laughs> almost like george clooney in a bat suit he just doesn't fit into the environment in it the is overall like george world. clooney in a bat suit yeah. that's a great comparison yeah and i heard that clark gable didn't even want to shave his mustache like you said but he didn't even want his hair in like a ponytail because it was too feminine and the way that his uh pants had like knee patches on him yeah. he was just he like just seems like a very picky actor for the yeah. time who just kind of used his power to to sway his roles in one way or the other I just don't think he fits in this movie, especially compared to it happened one night, which was the last winner of the seventh Academy Awards. He still talks in that same kind of vibrato and he's very quick witted and he's funny, but he's like a, this kind of cheeky guy who's also supposed to be like our manly hero that saves the day. And he's a little just too smug for our lead quote unquote. Cause I don't really think there's a lead in this movie, but he's our, lead per se on the good side yeah and and i don't think i don't think we're saying though that he gave a bad performance in no, fact in fact i not, thought it no. was it i thought i think he gave like a great performance it's just the casting is a little weird and it and it checks off the first box of the how do we make an old big time hollywood movie well we get a big star like clark Gable just to throw him in there into this main role even though he may not fit and box checked yeah, that'll get butts in the seats. It'll yeah. draw women to go see the movie because he was a huge like sex icon, especially after it happened one night, which yeah. I'm sure there was tons of people talking about the movie and how he unbuttons, buttons his, unbuttons his shirt and does all these He's very shirtless sexual again in this things. Movie? Yes, he is shirtless or has his uh, shirt unbuttoned multiple times throughout this movie. It feels like he's being used in a weird way yeah. where it's like you use a really famous actor to kind of draw eyes to a film, but he doesn't really get the main lead performance in a way. Like he does essentially, cause he does lead the, the mutiny, but it, it almost just seems like an inconvenience. Like he's only leading the mutiny because it's inconvenient for him. Not so the men that are being like abused and tortured on the ship. Right. And this was based off of history. And we obviously don't know the the true history of how Fletcher Christian, you know, did the mutiny on the bounty. But it was as a revolt against Bly's, you know, inhumanity and his practices towards his uh, crewmen and the people below him. So you can you kind of see that in in Gable's character and his performance. But it is a little odd to look at. But it's really nice to look at. He's a very good looking guy and he looks great in a ponytail without a mustache. And that's all that matters. And that's all that MGM probably cared about was just that they're going to make money off of Clark Gable. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but it's definitely something to think about when you're piecing together this like big budget Hollywood movie and how they're able to get it off the ground. Ben, is there a particular scene that you liked a lot in the movie? Personally, I loved the opening scene of really the takeoff and goodbye from the bounty. And we see these like awesome grand shots, some great cinematography by Arthur Edison and I just loved seeing this huge boat and they really get a great perspective on it. Some awesome set design. The whole ship is like really well designed and it's beautiful. And we're getting this awesome introduction to like the score in the film and the, the kind of ocean noises and how the, the sails open up and all the men are like kind of sliding up and down, kind of setting up the boat. It's a really cool grand opening to the, the mutiny taking off from shore. Yeah, it definitely is. And it has to be attributed to a few things. One is I know the producer Irving Thalberg really took a lot of time for the production designers and costume designers to to look at how the costume or not the costumes, the uniforms were made during that time in the Royal Navy. And I there's rumors that Charles Lawton even found the same tailor or at least the company that made Bly's clothing and that he personally requested to have his clothing and measurements almost exactly the same as Bly's to really go into the role, which I think adds to his performance or at least the uh, the mystique behind it when you're researching and looking it up. But yeah, it's a really interesting thing that they are able to set up, which is this really grand you know boat, uh, the Bounty. 
And what's really more compelling about that is it's Frank Lloyd who directed the film. And if you remember a few episodes ago, he would he directed the movie Cavalcade, which won Best Picture. And me and John basically bashed the cinematography and the directing of that movie because it was very stagnant. The shot choices were very much, you know, it looked like it was, they were just filming a play happen on stage, which, you know, is kind of what Cavalcade was. It was based off a stage play. But anyways, there is some advancement in the cinematography, the design, the way things look, where the camera angles that Floyd, that Frank Lloyd definitely improved upon in this film. So it's very noticeable when you compare those two films and it immediately makes you think like, oh, he learned his lesson and it's much better now. And he's like growing and developing as a director. But also I think the industry is growing and developing a little bit more too. And this is one of those like next steps that they take in this big budget Hollywood movie. Yeah, I think this opening and, and leaving shore is really sh- telling of just how big the budget is, like how much money they had to to recreate this boat and to have all these different shots of the men going up and down from the sails. And it just shows you that we're in for a, like a big journey and it's it's a lot of money spent on this film. And yeah. this is going to be not just your average film. Yeah, the budget for this film at the time, it was $1.95 million, which I think was the biggest at the time. Yeah. Which and I th- and translating to today's in 2020 for inflation, I think it's about 37 million, which isn't a lot for a big budget movie. But you can imagine though that a big budget movie now would probably be made, uh, or this movie now would be made for an exorbitant amount of money, uh, like it was back then, and it made a lot of money too out of it. So it was definitely like a really risky uh, film to make by MGM, but they definitely pulled it off. And one of the cool things about how they filmed this is that they actually filmed on location in Tahiti and they went to French, the French Polynesian islands to film this like replica of the bounty. It adds some more flair to the film and you're, you actually appreciate it more because you're like, wow, they actually took the time to do this instead of just shooting it on the back lot, which they did do some things in the back lot. They did some things in some of the, the ports and bays in Southern California and and that's totally fine, but they actually were able to do a little bit more, which I think adds to the appeal of this film and it makes you, appreciate that they went through great lengths and i think actually frank lloyd originally wanted to do the whole thing on the ship and irving thalberg was just like no we're, we're not doing this whole thing on a ship yeah probably because of how insane the budget was <laughs> yeah I, and you know shooting on location especially on a boat is dangerous in itself and yeah. we saw that uh over time and during the production actually a, an assistant cameraman named glenn strong was killed as well as other technical workers were injured because a barge, one of the, the prop boats, was uh, essentially capsized and sank, and uh, one of the assistant cameramen died. So it's it's showing how probably dangerous of a production this was, probably how long and detailed, and supposedly they even shot 131 million feet of film for this movie. So it's so much went into this. There's yeah. so much probably footage that was just edited out of this, and they were probably just constantly rolling to make this epic. And I think I would call it an epic. Yeah, it's it's definitely an epic because it, it goes, I, again, like if we're going to check off boxes for what makes a big Hollywood movie in 1935, it's a big star like Clark Gable and Charles Lawton. Like, don't not to forget Charles Lawton because he, pro- he was billed as the top actor of the movie. But then you also add these grand scale sets, like being literally on the ocean to film this. You add you know, expensive shots, making sure everything looks beautiful and looks right. And I think while watching it, when me and John watched this together, we definitely felt there was a lot to take in and it really was an an expensive film. And there was a a world that you could believe that was set up by this, by just the cinematography, that there was a, a huge world that you can just plant yourself in and you felt like you were actually on this ship. It is though a little strange that the whole movie is like in daylight and it's really bright and adds to a little bit more, ha- adds some more happy tones. And I think that don't necessarily have to be there. I don't know what you felt about it, there being constant daylight. I know practically they probably needed it to shoot the film, but there's some tonage in there. That's a little weird for me because it's always in daylight. Yeah. For the majority, there's a couple of night scenes, but if for more, more so for me, it was the lack of color in this film. I think, in all the films we've seen so far, they've all been black and white. Obviously, we haven't reached the color era. But in this in particular, when we're talking about lush islands of Tahiti, beautiful ocean waters, you know, sailing and these big, just disgusting boats, as we'll get into the details of what happened on the boat, 
I wanted to see some color, like some contrast between, you know, the boat and the ocean, the islands, the, the people of Tahiti, like all these different elements that I just feel like aren't as properly represented in color. And this was like the first film that really struck me that I was like, damn, I wish this was actually in color. It looks though at times that there's not enough like grime and, and dirt on the ship. And yeah, like you could probably toss it up to like, oh, Bly is like making his crew very strict. Yeah. yeah, he's very strict in making his crew clean the ship a lot but there is a lot of pristine aspects to uh, the ship and then when we get to Tahiti that there is no difference in how you're like taking it all in so maybe that was just because they were very anal about making sure everything looked like the set looked nice and clean for the shoot which is totally fine but yeah you do wish there was some more grit and grime and and you're using the word color I I think color is more meaning that there's more into the world that's already even though it's a great world they built but a little bit more believable, which I definitely agree they could have done on the ship and on the island too. Well, it's clear that this is a popular film. Um, not very only, popular. Not only is it our first remake, but it's also based off of a novel again, which is a very common occurrence that we've seen so far now in the Academy, especially for Best Picture. We originally have a movie called Bounty, which was a 1916 silent Australian film based on Mutiny on the Bounty as well. And then this is supposedly one of five adaptations of the film as there will be further adaptations after 1935. Yeah, so it's, it's certainly a popular movie that does get remade over time. And I'm pretty sure that the 1962 remake with Marlon Brando was a Best Picture nominee at the time, or at least was nominated for Academy Awards. Uh, future Ben and John, when they're looking back on this, can probably shame me. I probably <laughs> said something wrong, but this was a very interesting story, and it's and it's one of those movies that people really are into. Even a friend of ours that we were telling, oh, we're gonna watch this movie. He's like, oh, I read that book when I was a kid. So this is a very popular story for a lot of people, and especially for at the time when it was like fairly new. So this was an epic scale thing that had to be made, or at least they felt compelled to be made into film. So we keep on teasing uh, Charles Lawton and his performance as Captain Bly, and I just can't wait any longer to kind of talk about it. And I, I was saying to John that out of all the performances of the eight movies that we've seen, I think the, the, the best ones have been It Happened One Night with Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert. But the third one, I, to me, is Charles Lawton as Captain Bly. I love it. I think that him as the villain is perfect. He is so, there is so much tension there. He's this he's sort of grotesque. Well, especially when at the end when uh, he brings that mutiny mutiny ship to to port when he's like has all that scruff on his face and he's like dehydrated and exhausted after fifty nine. I think it's fifty nine days of being mutinied at sea. And so there's just so much that Lawton brings to the character, especially when you learn about that he got the a Bly's tailor to make his clothing and, and he read some of the Bly's logs that when he was the captain. So he really engrossed himself into the film and he comes from that old, you know, Shakespearean old Vic uh, style of acting. So there's a lot to just Charles Lawton as himself and also Captain Bly as a character. Uh, and I just, I love it. It's, it's one of my favorite performances, even out of the collective of best picture winners. It's still one that I think stands out to me just because I thought it was a really good villain. Yeah, we talk a lot about Clark Gable as a star, but he wasn't actually the top billed actor. It was actually Charles Lawton. And we talked previously about Charles Lawton in the 6th Academy Award because he won Best Actor Oscar for his portrayal of King Henry VIII in The Private Life of King Henry VIII. And you also see him on notable uh, film roles like Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Barretts of Wimpole Street. He's definitely someone that we just will see probably continuously from here on out. He's someone that uh, he does ooze a sense of just like nastiness, <laughs> you know, like a sense of before he even says a word, you're just like, oh, this dude's going to be this dude's going to be trouble. He's going to be pain. And yeah. he's just brutal on on the crew here. And he's just constantly he almost enjoys the way that they're suffering. Oh, he and, loves and it. We we're comparing this to Star Wars and and Darth Vader, and we definitely get a lot of kind of similarities. And I think George Lucas definitely had a big pull from this film and brought it into Darth Vader, the way he talks to the crewmen, ordering them around and punishing him the same way that uh, Vader does to the stormtroopers and the way Vader kind of uh, 
chokes the officers <laughs> on uh, yeah. on the star space on the starships and it's very similar and you could totally see the performance kind of carried over to star wars so many years later after this yeah i feel like that you can see a lot of villains later on that are similar to Bly and Bly's evilness is not as grandiose as Darth Vader's um, or like Hal 9000 in, in a certain way. Like it's very he he respects the the Royal Navy. And we, we talked about this at the beginning. Like he respects his role within that. And he believes that punishment, flogging, keel hauling is totally acceptable. And it just creates this this tense atmosphere throughout the film, because every time he's on screen, you're kind of you know, clutching the edge of your seat, like, okay, like what is Bly about to do? Is Bly going to be okay with this? Is he going to punish this guy? What, like, how is he going to take just someone, you know, like he, he got on someone who was washing the deck of the ship and who had bloody knees. And he said, I just want water to wash off my knees. And he was like, we're going to keel haul this guy. And they, and keel hauling for those who don't know is when you literally drag someone's body under the ship. So it's just a death sentence. And he dies. Yeah, yeah he, he, he just dies horribly. Yeah, he dies. It's actually a pretty graphic shot. It's pretty funny. I, yeah. I laughed at it because it's, <laughs> it's clearly a model ship it, that they're dragging a yeah. fake dead body behind. Yeah, it, it is clearly like that. But also at the same time for 1935, you can imagine. It was probably, probably very disturbing. It was very There's probably gasps in the audience when you saw that. Yeah. And so and Bly is a disturbing guy. He he enjoys. He's sadistic. He's menacing to, towards his crew. He loves, he loves the torture. Uh, and he loves, especially uh, in, a, in a moment where he gives Fletcher Christian the ability to go on the island to Tahiti. He gives him that day to enjoy himself and then just to pull it away. Yeah. And, and then pulls it away last second. It's like, nah, I'm not going to give it to you. And, but even though Christian ignores it, it's still that ruthlessness that is instilled in Bly. And there's also a sense of, uh, a regalness in Lawton's performance, you know, and I think that has to do with his old Vic background and doing a lot of Shakespearean plays. Like, I don't know how you felt about that too. No, it's definitely Shakespearean in the way he kind of speaks and dictates throughout the film. He's, he's disgusting. Honestly, he, he, I was so like appalled by his character and he was just completely miserable. He was enjoying the way he like tortured these men. he, he would hang some men up by the the ropes of the sails and just let them sit out there. There's a, a really awesome scene that I enjoyed where Fletcher has to go rescue one of the crewmen who's on top of the very tippy top of the sail on the boat. It's a Byam that he rescues. Oh, right. Yeah. And he Fletcher rescues Byam on the very tippity top of the boat's uh, sail. And he has to go up there in the middle of a storm and bring him down. And then Byle essentially says, nope, put him right back up there. He's got to do his job. <laughs> He like enjoys torturing the men and it's it's becomes hard to watch definitely. It's almost torture porny for the first like hour of the film because it's so much of the film is just showing us how cruel and evil he is to build up that kind of tension and to build up that want to get rid of him and kick him out of there. And we do get like some hints to his backstory. There's um as we were talking about a little earlier, there's Captain Cook who is supposedly his superior and his captain back in the day who's no longer no longer who's now no longer living and he mentions him a, a couple times and it's probably that he was treated really poorly almost in the same way like frat boys like yeah. are uh, you know initialized an and initiated yeah. and beat and by the time that they're seniors or juniors they kind of are enjoying the pain because they remember their own pain and misery yeah and you, and you brought up a good point that there is it is a little torture porn with how Bly enjoys, you know, hit, torturing his, his, his crew. And I think that also adds, it's a negative aspect though for the film because it lengthens the time to get to the mutiny. And that's why it, it does feel like it, ta it takes so long to get to that, this big epic point in the mutiny an hour and a half in because they keep on building up and building up and building up that Bly is this awful person. And you get that pretty much right away. And you almost wish that they, they did take a somewhat a different approach, but it still works because of Charles Lawton. I, I still think Charles Lawton's performance like really does make the film great. There's, there's just so much to dissect from here, but one of the most interesting things that comes out of Captain Bly's performance or Charles Lawton's performance as Bly is how it resonated with our current leaving president, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so Trump back in April 14th of 2020, he tweeted this. He says, tell the Democrat governors that mutiny on the bounty, 
was one of my all-time favorite movies. A good old-fashioned mutiny every now and then is an exciting and invigorating thing to watch, especially when the mutineers need so much from the captain. Too easy. One, he completely does not realize that he's actually probably on the Fletcher Christian side than the Captain Bly side because he's saying a mutiny is good here. And then, so, if it's one of his all-time favorite movies, wouldn't he remember that Captain Bly was the one who was getting mutinied and not the one doing the mutiny? That's just one thing. And the second thing, he openly describes himself as this awful person. And this isn't meant to be a political thing. It's just kind of ironic that, like, this is brought up and it was brought up in present day not too long ago about Captain Bly and how it relates to American politics today. Yeah, yeah. Pre- completely blind. The man definitely, yeah. doesn't, <laughs> definitely doesn't remember the movie that much. No. And we've talked a lot about, we have Christian Fletcher, who's Clark Gable, and now we have Captain Bly. And, and if you haven't seen this movie, you would imagine that it's mainly kind of their back and forth that takes up the majority of the film. But in fact, this is a really big cast. And there there's a lot of moments that are given to not just Clark Gable and not just Charles Lawton, but you also have Franchot Tone, who plays Roger Byam. And he's a huge portion because he's kind of the, I would say, gray in between the the black and white of he's like the Captain neutral. Bly. He's like the neutral of between Fletcher and Bly in the film. Exactly. Yeah. Would you say this movie is uh, an ensemble cast? I wouldn't say it's an ensemble cast just because, just because it really is. It was billed as Charles Lawton and Clark Gable. And, and Franchot Tone is good, but he didn't really do that much really before or after this movie. And then the supporting cast, there are some people that are, are recognized. Like there's a character named Smith who is doesn't say really anything, but he's just there for comedic bits. And he's played by Herbert Munden, who played Alfred Bridges in Frank Lloyd's Cavalcade. So there's that tie in there. And supposedly they added the Smith things because Thalberg wanted more comedy in the film and Smith's big he, two things. One, he tries to throw piss and shit off the boat into the wind. And so he does that and it hits him in the face and then he does it again. But before he does it, he uh, sticks his finger in his mouth to, and points up to the sky to feel where the wind's coming. So that's funny. And then the second thing that he's sort of used for, for comedic relief is on the Island. He falls in love with some woman that he, they just show her. And then a bunch of kids follow him when he has to leave the Island. They're all upset. So he like ingratiates himself into the world of Tahiti. So that's Herbert Munden, but there's also Donald Crisp who plays a character named Burkett and he would go on to win an Oscar for best supporting actor in 1941 for how green was my Valley, um, which was a a John Ford film. So I wouldn't say it's an ensemble cast, but it features some really interesting actors uh, within the realm of the film. Yeah. You mentioned comedy and we talked about how the beginning of this film, I would really say the first half of this movie is very torture porny in the way that it's just aggressively showing you how horrible these men are being treated and all the brutal ways they're being tortured, but it's contrasted with comedy, like you're saying. The way that he throws shit and it falls back directly on him, and there's a scene with Clark Gable who's essentially convincing uh, Roger Byam and some of the other men and officers on the boat to like look at a swinging lantern, <laughs> and it, they basically look at the lantern so long that they become seasick because it's rocking back and forth. And it's like these childish gags that are just kind of thrown in between these like torture scenes from Cla- Captain Bly. And it is it did not work for me at all. It, t- it kept taking me out of the film so much. It was like you either have to commit on one end if this film should be a drama. Drom- it's not a drama because they don't put that much comedy in it. But they're conflicting these really dramatic and intense torture scenes with like goofy childish humor. It just didn't work. I think that checks off another box of old time Hollywood movies where something can be very serious and let's just throw in a comedic gag because some percentage of the audience loves comedy and we're just going to throw that in there just because we can. And it is a little weird. It's funny. It is funny for us to watch now just because it's so stupid and goofy, but it doesn't, you're right. It doesn't work for the film. It's who cares that they're just watching this lantern go back and forth. It does nothing to advance the actual plot of the story it's just some gag they can throw in there because they know that they're going to get some sort of approval uh, yeah. when they do test screenings for it. I think it pads on unnecessarily amount of time to the film. I think the film's too long in general, which will kind of get into the end and all the mishaps of going to the island, leaving the island. But there's another actor I want to shout out, which is Eddie Quillen, pl- who plays uh, Ellison in Mutiny on the Bounty. And I think he really has the most tragic background and story. He's a character that is not 
too front and center, but he is there enough that you get a good picture. He's a he's one of the Navy crew that really just gets dragged onto the boat. He has a wife and a newborn, and he doesn't want to leave, but they kind of grab him at the bar, and they're basically like, you're in the Navy now. Like, you're coming with us, and he's very adamant. Like, I don't want to leave my wife and kids, and he ends up uh, with a mutiny as well and leaves uh, the mutiny led by Fletcher Christian and he stays on the island for a little bit, but he does want to go back. So he does go back with Roger Byam and wants kind of to see his family again. And it's really sad, but they really instead want to focus on Roger, who's a much more plain Jane character, who's way more boring and way more uninteresting, when they could have just focused on Ellison, who's got this, like, tragic, horrible backstory. Like, he's been away from his family for, like, four years because of this stupid fucking boat. Yeah. And I just wish they kind of spent more time with him. I think he's, in fact, the most interesting character in the entire film because he has that interesting backstory. He's weirdly one of the most in-depth characters, too, because he has that backstory. And he has this, like, kind of... He's in the same position that Roger is. Like, he kind of didn't want a mutiny, but he did because he hated Captain Bly. But, yeah, it's just one of those characters where I'm like, oh, there's so much good stuff right there. They could have worked with him so much more than just the boring Roger character. Yeah, they... Yeah, you're right. There, he is a little bit more interesting than Roger, but I think the thing, again, when we're, we're checking off these big Hollywood movie boxes is that they can now give Roger a Tahitian girl to marry and fall in love well, with. Let's it. jump into Tahitian <laughs> people. Let's jump into that. Yeah, like that. that's a thing we haven't even touched yet. And But first, I think we actually have to do we have to give some appraisal to the the filmmakers because they actually did a really good job of representation of the Tahitian people and what Tahiti was like at the time because they actually went on location to film there and they got some natives to play the characters and people in the village they did use some Americans to play the the lead Tahitians but they were of Native American or Mexican descent so they weren't directly Tahitian but they stereotyped them into that role. So there's like a little like, meh, that's not great, but also a lot more appraisal because they actually took the time to do it. So be- just wanted to throw that out there before we talk about the Tahitian people because it's a very unnecessary part of the film at times because it doesn't add to that what we were looking for, which was this big epic mutiny, which is kind of stopped when there's this big love story in the middle of the film. Yeah, it's not even in the middle of the film. That's the thing because we've already talked about how it's an hour and 30 minutes before the mutiny happens. So the mutiny happens. They leave the boat. They kick Captain Bly off the ship. They go off and are abandoned in sea while they f- go and stay in Tahiti with um, the bounty. The portrayal of Tahiti people is odd. It's it's fascinating that they actually hired Tahitian people to represent them in film. But there's also some iffy aspects of them. Like they portray the chief as like very idiotic in a way. Like he's childish and like. He just wants a hat and like they definitely portray him as lesser than than the rest of the people in the film, I think personally. And then on top of it, Roger's character, who eventually falls in love with one of the women, which we can talk about some of the romance in the film. And at one point, the wife that he falls in love with, he calls her a pollen monkey because she's searching through these books that he's writing for his dictionary to kind of translate their language. And he's just, like, so pissed at her that he says, which I would assume is a racist slur, like, I definitely not a fucking good thing to say to someone. Yeah. And, yeah, it's just, there's weird shit like that throughout this movie where I think there just could have been still better representation. Yeah, the the thing with the with the pollen monkey isn't great. Uh, the Heedy Heedy character, I didn't think he was childish, but I guess I can see why you're saying childish. I think it's uh, naivety because he's not, I'm not going to say he's not well-educated. He's just not educated in the sense of how Bly or Fletcher the, Christian, the, the proper English man. Yeah, well, when we say proper English, that has nothing to do with be, with really anything to learn in life. Because I actually do think that he he uh, was pretty wise. You know, he he made some good points, and there are some lines. That, yeah, I can see the childish aspects. He does. You can tell that they're trying a little bit, but there's also that kind of like he's still not as smart as these men. They, yeah, they still want to kind of represent both sides in a way. Yeah, they try to throw some of that like what you would expect out of a, a a a chief leader of a native island to give like this sage wisdom or be this like really open and free flowing person. So yeah, that's like not great, but it's not the, I don't think it's like really a bad representation of people. And, and when we were watching it, we all kind of like braced ourselves. We were like, okay, like how bad is this going to be? And it actually wasn't as bad as I think that we were all expecting to be. And, and then having to read up about it, how they did film a location, they rebuilt villages and in Tahiti and French Polynesia, and they went on all these locations. So they did 
a they took some care in, into it, which is great. But we also know during this time and era, there's a lot worse happening. So we can't just be like, oh, this is all forgiven. This is just something that they took some care into. And um, and it works a little bit. It, it does make it a little bit more palatable. But we also have to remember other aspects of the film industry at the time. Yeah, it could definitely could have been way, way worse. I, for me, the biggest issue with their representation in the film is that they're really just used for like a plot device to kind of bring the yeah. men on to set up just the ch- such a cheap love story between Roger uh, and his wife. And then, of course, there's it's uh, just Christensen's get... what Christian's wife as yeah. well. It's just to get Clark Gable, you know, shirtless, shirtless and to kiss a woman like once, yeah. I think maybe like. Yeah, but let's actually dive into another kind of romantic scene is one of uh, Fletcher Christian and Roger Byam uh, laying on the back uh, on the beach. I know that you were cr- crying of laughter when this happened and, and it was pretty funny. Uh, so if you want to describe kind of the scene and what's happening so in this moment. At this point, Roger and Christian are both on the island for what seems to be like year or years at this point. And they're very accustomed and used to it. Roger's kind of like accepted his life there. He has a wife and so does Christian have a wife. And they're basically just swimming together at this like swimming hole. And he comes back to Roger, who's just like laying in the grass and he has a banana and they both just like share mini bananas together with each other. Laying on the beach shirtless as their wives are swimming away. Yeah, swimming and talking. And it's definitely not even the only aspect of this weird sexual tension between the two of them because they are on that either side of Christian wanting to start this mutiny and be the the hero for these men and Roger is on this other side where he wants to be official. He wants to represent the Navy and his family and show that, you know, this distinct fraction of the military is, is worthy and means a lot to him. And it's like that chemistry kind of comes off sexual at times where they're kind of like combative with each other, but it's also like they're yelling, but they get close and they might kiss. <laughs> like there's weird sexual attention. I think throughout yeah. this movie between the two characters. Yeah, the watching that scene, there's a lot of uh, homoerotic vibes happening with it. And why, why it was made like that? I I don't know. I don't know. Like what the it the, could be completely unintentional. It but can, yeah, that's it, not even the only scene where there there's like sexual tension yeah. between the two men. But it's really hard not to think that way when the two wives go away and it's just Roger and Fletcher christian both laying on the it's very romantic it's like oh, I, yeah. i'm pretty sure the music was like really romantic too and they're yeah. both laying there shirtless and from the chest up too it's like you don't even see the bottom and all of a sudden they just pull bananas up and yeah. just start <laughs> like and I, nothing there i don't think there's anything wrong with it but how do you not get those vibes from it is basically our point so it's like really interesting that that was like thrown in there and and, and that's kind of like the whole you know the whole idea behind us bringing this up is like this whole ro- romantic storyline was just thrown in there to, again, to check that other box because we have Clark Gable and we can make the sexiness out of a mutiny. And, and, uh, to throw know. a woman on the poster, too. Yeah. It's like the, there's just no representation for the women in this movie at all. Yeah. Like there's, no, there's no excuse or trying to explain it. Like Women barely even have a line in this movie. Yeah, they just stare at, at the men every time they say something. And uh, you know, I think every time that they show Christian's wife, Every time they just go to like a single of her, it's just this really romantic, you know, soft, you know, focused shot of her and like her eyes are like gleaming and stuff. It's such a classic Hollywood like single of of a lady as she's staring at her man because she's just completely smitten that like, oh, my God, look at this guy. He's just he's, so, yeah. he's just so manly just because he just said a word to me. Well, it's a classic Irving Thalberg, the way he portrays women in film. I swear yeah. <laughs> it has to be directly related to that because every film that he's produced that we've watched now just has this weird aspect with women and that they instantly fall for men and it's all made even jarringly more so apparent after it happened one night which is like so natural and nuanced compared to any of these other relationships that we've seen in in any of these movies yeah post like it happened one night like we really are trying to find like more out of these like romances and stories. And unfortunately it just keeps on that train keeps on going where it just sucks. You know, there's just well, nothing. There's, yeah, there's nothing, nothing to the draw romance. out of the relationship. I couldn't even tell you one thing about either of the two women that are in this movie other than the one is the chief's daughter. That's literally it. I don't know anything about them. And then the one gave pearls to Clark Gable, which then captain Bly take away. There's just not much to digest even about their relationship either. We don't learn much about them 
Christian's character can't even really talk to his wife, and you don't really understand why they're even married. It's the problem with a big gap when they're on the island that the film just doesn't want to portray that life. Even though I think that's some of the most interesting parts of the movie is that after the mutiny happens, they're just kind of like left to rebuild their own civilization on Tahiti. But that's completely skipped over because they want to get back to Captain Bly and his boat being pissed and starving to death. <laughs> Which I did love. I did love those scenes. And I, they were some of my favorite scenes in the whole movie when they were trapped and kind of destined to die on this boat. And I love the shot of when they first see Land Ho and the men on the little boat that they're on are just so skinny. Yeah. Like the makeup is so impressive. Yeah. I don't even know if they got like new actors or what they did, but there's one man who sits up that literally looks like a skeleton. Yeah, I'm like, he, this he is looks insane. like he's aged. This is insane. This yeah. is like so well done. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's like again like that again with the issue of the of the romance story brings is that because it's a two hour and, and 10 minute movie you know length it just there there needs to be more there needs to be a better use of the time and they could have done this like kind of and i i think you said it they could have done like an epic fight battle you oh, know when yes. when the hms pandora comes yes. back to tahiti but they don't it's really just fletcher running away and he just gets away and then that's it i mean granted yeah the pandora does sink and that's like epic in its own right but it would have been more epic to see the ships battling or to really see bly almost get on christian's tail and like you know really almost see the bounty and he could have gone way more ruthless and they just don't because they wanted to fit in these scenes of love and romance that takes you out of the world that they did a really good job building up and if it was its own movie the romance i think it's a totally different thing like if they were like they got their they got shipwrecked on you know tahiti and they fell in love and integrated themselves with the people that's one movie that's fine but within this movie it just makes really no sense just adds too much time and they don't even give it really a, a chance to even develop they just say he met this woman, they fell into in love, they're married, and he's stable now on this island. Yeah, and I do wish there was more of a confrontational confrontation when they first get back to the island. Captain Bly comes with uh, the Pandora boat, the second boat, but there isn't. It's like that storytelling, once they get to the island, becomes very loose and almost hard to follow. Like, you're, you're kind of confused, like Pandora's coming in, but the men are, are leaving, but then the rest of the men are leaving on the bounty and they're 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 leaving to go to another island but then it's like so did they not see the bounty leave like these are huge massive boats with massive sails like wh- why isn't there like a ch- uh, more of a chase like why are we getting more aspects of like a drama and tension between the two they're just kind of rolling as fast as they possibly can at this point to like get to the end credits and show like the dramatic change of of saving Roger at the end. Like, it's like, I don't fucking care yeah. about Roger. Why is this movie now all about Roger? What the <laughs> fuck? Yeah. The, the ending does, it does shift because now we're going back to, we're going back to England after by and, and the people who went back to Bly and the Pandora at, They're They're now on trial. They're all going to be executed. The only person who gets saved is by And that's because his friend, Sir Joseph Banks talks to King George, which is a bit of a, like a, uh, rich boy gets what he wants at the end where it, it totally like works in Roger's favor. And there's like no consequence for like anything, whether he purposefully, you know, stayed behind in the cabin during the mutiny or if he wasn't like, that's even unclear. Yeah. It's very honestly. unclear. Like if he really, if there really was some intention for him to be part of the mutiny or not. But anyways, he's the only one that gets to survive the, your character you're talking about, you know, Ellison, he, uh, he gets to see his wife and kid one last time before he gets ex- executed. Um, and that's actually a historical inaccuracy I was looking up. They definitely would not have allowed that to happen. To so see un- his family at yeah, all. Yeah, so yeah. unfortunately, like, he would have just been Murdered killed. Yeah. immediately. Yeah, so, yeah, so, like, Roger gets out of it scot-free. The one nice thing, though, you get out of it is that Bly, he goes up to the head of the Navy and he's like, oh, this is a great day for us because we got these guys who mutinied me. And the head of the of the Navy looks at him and is like, what you did, you know, as a shipman is amazing that you were able to get back, you know, in that tiny little boat. It's one of the greatest naval accomplishments ever. And then just leaves it at that because he wants to say more that you're an asshole and it's your fault that this all happened. But he doesn't say that because he has some respect for the Navy. But that Bly's reaction to that, you can just see it just the 
sheer like happiness that he had a second ago is just like drained out of him and he goes back to the evil just like you know slumped over he sort of like quasimodo which like charles lawton does portray in his career it's so it's this weird ending where roger gets to survive we don't really know what happens to fletcher christian because it's sort of left up to the interpretation that they got to a random island and started over and roger gets to go free and Bly is probably going to go back to his old ways and everyone else dies or is with Fletcher Christian. So it's a very weird ending to this movie that had a lot of great potential. It took way too long to get to the epic moment that we wanted to see, which was really epic. And we haven't, we should talk about that right now. The actual mutiny was really good and really well shot and choreographed uh, throughout. There was a lot of dynamic uh, shot choices. I thought in that particular scene. Yeah. It's exciting as he gathers up all Fletcher kind of, finally decides that like this is it like this is the last thing captain Bly is going to do and he gathers up all the men and he he really sees that the two men that are kind of under under the ship and how they're chained up and it's kind of disgusting they have a bar in their mouth restricting them from even opening their mouth or closing it and he gathers gathers them up and they get captain Bly and we get to an awesome speech by captain Bly as they're about to like output him into the ocean on this tiny little boat with all the rest of the crew as they can barely squeeze and fit on the boat. Yeah, it is exciting, but it's again an hour and 30 minutes in this movie when it should have probably happened 45 minutes or maybe the first end of the first act. Do you want me to read Bly's speech and my Gollum voice or just like <laughs> oh, <a God>. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it, it is a really good speech. So let me actually read that little monologue because I think that it's uh, if you could look up like a clip of the movie, if you had to, if you didn't want to watch the whole thing, this is actually probably a Lawton's best monologue in the entire thing. So he says, casting me adrift 3,500 miles from a port of call. You're sending me to my doom, eh? Well, you're wrong, Christian. I'll take this boat as she floats to England if I must. I'll live to see you, all of you, hanging from the highest yardum of the British f- in the British fleet. So it's just like really like epic you know, speech monologue that – that Bly gives and they're all kind of just like, yeah, fuck you. See you later. But then it, it adds that motivation to, you know, law Lon brings that motivation to Bly's character where he's like, I'm determined to get back and to, to find uh, this port and to, and to survive this to get back at them, which he does. He ultimately is pretty successful at that. Oh yeah. He's so cynical and just maniacal, even at the very end where he's like basically admitting that like you're sending me to my death, but no way. I'm still beating you. Like I'm I'm never going to let you have the last word. He's that kind of villain. Oh yeah, he's 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 absolutely ruthless. Uh you know, we said the line in the beginning, you mutinous dogs. Uh another great quote from him is at the beginning he goes, "The ship's company will remember that I am your captain, your judge, and your jury. You do your duty and we may get along. Whatever happens, you'll do your duty." So again, like Bly is just this ruthless like to the books character and in the end he does get what he wants, which for those who are very into villains, uh, you probably love that. You probably love seeing the villain prevail uh, in certain ways at the end. But it's just this really weird, open-ended thing that you feel kind of like sorry for the guys who get killed. And you're like, fuck you, Roger, for getting to survive. And like, are you even going to go back to your and wife like, that you told that you really loved? That to, you know, you just had Tahiti? a wife on Tahiti and yeah. you dipped. So like, you, no relation to that at all. Are you going to tell your wife that you were fucking a Tahiti girl for years? Yeah. And married to a Tahiti girl for years? Yeah. Come on. Very, very, very messed up. But uh, that's Mutiny on the Bounty, pretty much. Are there any final thoughts before we jump into the Academy Awards of that year? Overall, I really respect the film for not only its acting and a lot of the cinematography and kind of the building up to the mutiny, even though I think it's like way too long and it should be kind of cut down and the script should be adjusted in certain ways. It just lets me down in the way that I just don't understand who I'm supposed to be feeling for in this movie. Like who am I supposed to be rooting for? And at first it's like, Oh, you're rooting for the men and you're rooting for Fletcher or you're rooting for the men that like are being abused. You're like, you feel bad for them. And then it's like, Oh, it's Fletcher. Who's the main character. Who's going to lead us through. And then he kind of, fades away as the main character because there's no really main character and then they force you to kind of feel for Roger even though he's the least interesting character throughout the entire movie I just didn't understand what they wanted from me as a viewer it was like this weird conflicting feeling where I just just didn't understand the movie where I just I know I'm supposed to be angry at at Charles Lawton's character as Captain Bly but like, how am I supposed to feel at the end of this movie? Like, what what am I supposed to take away from this whole movie? Why did I watch this two-hour and <laughs> ten-minute movie 
when I just knew there was a mutiny already in it. Well, you watched it because it was a Best Picture winner. I and, did. And, I and did. you have to put it into their perspective. And at the time, it was a big Hollywood production. And I don't think they probably expected that the longest lasting character of it is Charles Lawton, uh, Captain Bly. And uh, that villain character just really sticks to me. And, and that's what I take away from it. I just think that we got a really great performance by an actor that probably a lot of people don't really get to really know about or have heard of before, but he's a really interesting person. There's a lot to his personal life, to how he was brought up, to the roles he did. Uh, he's a guy that I think would, would be awesome to see today in some certain roles. And he's a, it's a character that has obviously influenced so many villains and especially like our probably, you know, we said our favorite ones at the beginning, but probably every, the collective society's favorite villain, which is Darth Vader. Uh, there, you can't tell me that George Lucas wasn't thinking of Captain Bly when thinking of Darth Vader. So we'll just leave it at that, and we'll jump right into the 8th Academy Awards. The 8th Academy Awards were held on March 5th, 1936 at the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles, California. They were hosted by Frank Capra and included a new category for Dance Direction. This year, the Academy gives the honorary award to D.W. Griffith for his distinguished creative achievements as director, producer, and his invaluable initiative and lasting contributions to the progress of motion picture arts. Now, if you were to ask someone in 2020 about his contributions to <laughs> film, uh, they might say it's uh, quite negative because yeah. if you don't know, D.W. Griffith is the director of Birth of a Nation, a very racist propagandist film from 1915. And we'll just we'll just leave it at that. Best assistant director went to Clem Beauchamp and Paul Wing for the lives of a Bengal Lancer. Uh, so to give some background on these guys, so uh, Beauchamp he would stay mostly behind the scenes, but he would actually become a production designer on films like High Noon, Death of a Salesman, and Judgment at Nuremberg. And then Paul Wing he would only work on two films in his career, uh, including the lives of a Bengal Lancer, uh, which is his last because he would go on to serve in the U.S. Army. And he was a prisoner of war, and he survived. And um, the camp that he was at is the basis of a film called The Great Raid in 2005. Best Dance Direction goes to Broadway Melody of 1936 by Dave Gould. Now, you'll note that you might recognize a Broadway Melody from oh, the good. Can't get away from it. <laughs> second Academy Award winner from 1928-29. Uh, not much is similar, supposedly, other than a few songs and the same exact name. Um, you're gonna go watch this, Ben? <laughs> no, I'm not gonna watch this <laughs> hot plate of garbage. Probably, <laughs> I the so it's. I think it's just funny that this like sequel to this Best Picture winner won for Best Dance Direction, considering that the original Broadway melody had awful choreography, like out of sync choreography. It's also Best Dance Direction is a little. For us, I think it's a little weird to be like the honored something like that. And this is a very short lived award. Um, so I don't know what you feel like about having this award. Like, is this an award that you think could have lasted longer? Or are you kind of happy that this kind of only lasted for three years and that was kind of it? No, I don't really think this makes much sense. And supposedly this only lasted a few years, I believe four years. And it was removed simply because a lot of directors and producers felt that a direction award should be limited and specific to the directors and not just a choreographer. Now, I mean, there is a key point here, though, that if they're awarding dance direction, dance and musicals are a huge part of Hollywood. And especially in this time where we now have music and people are excited to go sing and dance and sing along to, to, to the movies now, it makes you just think about how many musicals they were in, in how many musicals they were out at the time and how just dominant it was as a genre and now to compare that from now when you see what maybe two musicals in a year you barely see any musicals especially out of hollywood these days yeah it's it's definitely lost in its time because the musical form was completely and 100 percent more appreciated back then and especially because they put it on screen and everyone just loved Broadway and singing and songs so I get why it was like they felt that that and they needed to honor it in a certain way but I'm happy that just doesn't exist it feels like a very unnecessary award uh completely and uh it went to probably a very unnecessary movie the Broadway melody of 1936 <laughs> hey you can't say that until you watch it 
which is also funny. It, it, they called it Broadway Melody of 1936, and it came out in 1935. What? Who the fuck is in charge of these movies? And they were predicting them? the future, Ben. They were showing us what dancing it was like a year <laughs> in the future. Come on. Just one year later. Yeah, just one year. That's all they needed. God, idiots. Anyways, moving on. Best film editing went to A Midsummer Night's Dream to Ralph Dawson. Uh, so Ralph Dawson, he would go on to win two more awards for best film editing, which is tied for the most with Michael Kahn, which is a Spielberg collaborator on most of his films, Thelma Schoonmaker, who is, you know, Scorsese's like right hand lady in absolutely everything. And then Daniel Mendel, who would go on to edit uh, The Best Years of Our Lives, which won Best Picture. He collaborated with William Wyler and Billy Wilder on a bunch of films. He also did The Pride of the Yankees and he did The Apartment, which won Best Picture. So you have four. So you have um, Ralph Dawson, who uh, kind of cements himself as one of the earlier best film editors. And you, he's now uh, tied with some of the, probably the best of all time uh, in that area. Best cinematography goes to Hal Moore for A Midsummer Night's Dream. Hal Moore would be the only writing category this year, and it would be the last year that the Academy allowed write-ins. Moore would also go on and win Best Cinematography for Phantom of the Opera in 1943. Yeah, so he's the only person to win a write-in award. Uh, I kind of wish they had write-ins now. I mean, they're totally not going to do it because there would be so many... So many issues. There would be so many issues with that. Well, the question is, how do you, who's right, who's allowed to write in? You know, is it just right. the academy first, and then once you have those write ins, how do you figure out how many write ins you're allowed to include? Does right. that is that mean you don't include certain actors that you they think should be nominated to leave space for like one write in? Or there's so many just different questions and yeah. analytics you need to look at and compare to see if that would even be possible. But I mean, it would be nice yeah. to and, have a write in category. Yeah, it would be. And also, you have to keep in mind that the Academy Awards in this time was not like what it is today uh, where it's at this huge theater and there are hundreds of people gathering and the voting body is like thousands of people back then it was just like in a small banquet hall and there's really not that many people who are voting on this so I guess writing candidates were a little bit easier to manage but it's really cool that we got to see someone who did win as a write-in and then was the reason why they don't do write-ins anymore because people are probably like well fuck this you know we're not gonna have this anymore Best art direction went to Richard Day for The Dark Angel. Uh, Richard Day, he was going, he goes on to win a total of seven Oscars in this category out of 13 nominations. And he won for two future Best Picture winners for How Green Was My Valley and On the Waterfront. And both those movies have very, very good production designs. Richard Day, I got to remember that name. So that's got to be the highest for best art direction, I would imagine. There's no way someone has more than seven Academy Awards no, I for think, art direction. I think Cedric Gibbons does. Damn. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think Cedric Gibbons does. Who was the one who like made the Oscar statuette himself? Mm, that makes a little. That makes sense. Oh, mm, I wonder oh, why he is. A lot the of most. politics. Mm. A lot of politics. Which Moving we'll on. dive into more as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Best sound recording goes to Douglas Shearer for Naughty Marietta. So this was Shear's second win in this category out of an eventual seven. And he was just another uh, guy that was probably part of the politics of, uh, of that time. So he was also the brother of, Nor of Norma Shear, who uh, I think is the first woman to win Best Actress. So take that for what you will, that he's kind of part of this uh, family of uh, filmmakers that gets recognized a lot by the Academy. Moving on, though, Best Song goes to Lullaby of Broadway from Gold Diggers of 1935, music by Harry Warren and lyrics by Al Dubbin. So the song uh, was introduced in the musical film Gold Diggers of 1935, and what was unusual about it is it was used as background music in a sequence in the Betty Davis uh, film Special Agent that came out that same year. And again, that same year, it was sung by Gene Cohen in a nightclub scene in the James Cagney film G-Men. Uh, so it's very odd to see this uh, best original song, not only just in one film, but then it's used in two other films that year. So I guess they kind of had to give uh, that song uh, the best original song award. What's weird is that we now see that category labeled as best original song. Yeah. And I wonder if that had to do something with the way that uh, you could take a song like the lullaby of Broadway and kind of put it in other films. And I wonder if they were like, 
this should be defined in one specific film. It should be made for the film itself, and that's how we define this. Yeah. Well, it was originally made for for the Gold Diggers of 1935. It's just that, I guess, at the time it came out, other people, or at least probably the behind-the-scenes people from these other movies, really liked it, and they wanted just to throw it in into their movies. It is a little odd, and I am pretty sure that there's a lot of debate about Best Original sc- uh, Song among the the music uh, branch of the Academy Awards, just because it there is a lot of nuances to, to songwriting and music. And, you know, you know, we even have a whole separate awards just for music and the Grammys, which is a whole other political shit show in and of itself. But, uh, yeah, it's a little weird, but it's not the strangest thing I think we'll ever see out of an mm-hmm. Oscar uh, awards. What's well, interesting, if we compare from 2019 – our most recent Oscar while well, we're recording this shallow by Lady Gaga and Ma- Mark Ronson won for best original song. So in 2019, if they were to use that same song in another movie the same year, I don't think it would qualify for best original song or would it be just the first film that used that song? I think that a star is born would, would still count just not the film that used it afterwards. Yeah. Interesting. I would say that if they used it in multiple films, that it would just be disqualified just because it's used in multiple films. But that might not be true. Like, what if they came out the same day? Yeah. Well, let me put it. There's a lot of minutia here that gets really confusing. Let's go ahead into the future a little bit. Let's talk about the song Streets of Philadelphia by Bruce Springsteen, which won for the movie Philadelphia for best original song. But that mo- but that song takes on a whole new life of itself in a Bruce Springsteen show. So it, it like, is that fair of it? Because it's a Bruce Springsteen song, but it's like made for the film, but it's like, he then goes on to use it in so many more of his shows and live acts. Like there, it, it just, there are so many nuances and we can just pick at this a little bit, but I think ultimately it's like just really interesting that this song was the one for best original song or best song. And then was used two more times in the same exact year. Best scoring goes to RKO Radio Studio Music Department for The Informer. This category was originally called Best Scoring. At the time, winners and nominees were a mix of original scores as well as adaptations of pre-existing material. So that kind of goes back to our conversation in the the previous uh, for Best Song where it's like now it's like a mixture of existing material and original stuff. And one of the other nominees this category is Mutiny on the Bounty, which... We immediately picked up on like the a lot of we called it the SpongeBob music because there's a lot of like that like SpongeBob music. I can't I don't know how to hum it right now for everyone to sing, but look up like SpongeBob like music. C tunes, yeah, uh, yeah, it's like C tunes and like that's like part of like Muni on the Bounty's, um, you know, score. So it's a little interesting that uh, that some of that existing material like gets on to be used, and I I'm not sure like how original it really was in the movie. The score isn't like that big in Muni on the Bounty. But it, apparently in the informer, it was good enough for it to win. And this is a going to be a common trend as we go through these categories that the informer kind of uh, knocks around mutiny on the bounty a little bit. Best short subject cartoon, which goes again, another one, to Walt Disney <laughs> Productions and United Artists for Three Orphan Kittens. So we joked last time that, uh, you know, it's just like Walt Disney just keeps on getting all these awards for all these short cartoons. But... The Three Orphan Kittens uh, was not such a great, um, not such a great movie uh, in terms of its uh, racial uh, tones. So there is a black kitten that encounters a doll, and and he flipped it, uh, and it becomes a stereotypical African American girl, which shouts "Mammy." Uh, and this was kind of edited out in the fifties and sixties by Disney because for broadcast on television, they didn't want to, they kind of want to hide this like naughty past of themselves, this racist past of themselves. And then in the From the Vault like kind of series, they bring it back and they kind of just say like, yeah, this is this was made like this back then. And it's not great, but it was um, it was made and they and they kind of own up to it. So even though we give another Oscar to Walt Disney for a short subject cartoon, it was not a very friendly short subject cartoon. Best live action short subject novelty goes to Wings Over Everest by Gamont British and Skibo Productions. This is a 1933 film about the expedition by Douglas Hamilton, the 14th Duke of Hamilton, where he cleared the southern tip of Mount Everest with a single-engine biplane by just a few feet, and they actually used real footage in the film to show his expedition. i got to check that out. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it does sound really cool. I think it's like only a 20-minute film. Who was up there filming? 
That, I don't it was know. on Mount Everest just <laughs> waiting for him to fly by. I need to know. I don't know. I need to know. I need to know. <laughs> Best live action short subject comedy went to How to Sleep by Jack Chertok and MGM. Uh, so this is actually a kind of a goofy uh, th- a short film. It was kind of goes through like four like little phases of going to sleep. And it was based on a study by the Mellon Institute and like, some sleep study they were doing. And the movie was actually widely praised like everyone a lot of people really liked it and the only people to give like a public disapproval was the melon institute because it was making fun of their study of of sleep so take that for what it is but how to sleep sounds like a very funny uh gaggy short film best adaptation goes to dudley nichols for the informer based on a novel by liam o'flattery now nichols is very important and probably the most interesting aspect of this award show was because he denied the award for The Informer and writing The Informer. Nicholas supposedly declined the Academy Award for The Informer due to a dispute he had with the Writers Guild and the Academy. While he did collect the award later in 1938's Oscar ceremony, he had some very choice words to say, which was quoted in 1935 in the New York Times. As one of the founders of the Screenwriters Guild, which was conceived in revolt against the Academy, and born out of disappointment with the way it functioned against the employed talent in any emergency, he wrote, I deeply regret I am unable to accept the award. To accept it, he said, would it be to turn my back on nearly a thousand members of the Screenwriters Guild? Now, Ben, what do you got to say to that? Why do you think he is so adamantly on declining this for the Screenwriters Guild? Well, there's definitely been a long history of of dispute between writers and producers in Hollywood. There's a a large, large debate, I feel like, as to who are like the true creators of films at times. Is it the screenwriter? Is it the producer who picks the project? You can go at it at at several different ways, but there has been a history of of tension between the two. Uh, So it's very ballsy, one of Dudley Nichols' to do this, uh, I don't think it really would happen now. It would take, I think, a lot. I think there would have to be another strike happening uh, for a writer to refuse the the award and then publicly say this. Um, So it's great for him that he's able to do that, and I think it kind of plays into some of the the bad aspects of the Academy Awards at this time because there's a lot of politics going on. But in this Best Adaptation uh, Screenplay category, is also Mutiny on the Bounty. So Mutiny on the Bounty, again, is beat by the Informer. So how do we feel about that? How do we feel about this script that that we were just talking about not winning? I feel like I need to go watch the Informer instead of Mutiny on the Bounty. (laughs) I'm going to Dudley Nichols. I think this rejection to me is kind of summed up in one word, and that's uncredited. There's been many times that we've done this podcast now, eight episodes in, that we've either left out uncredited, which may be against our own part, and sometimes we've included uncredited writers or uncredited cinematographers or even producers. I think that some of the issue and why he may have created the Screenwriters Guild was specifically to acknowledge every writer. There, Most movies do not have one particular writer. In fact, Dudley Nichols probably even didn't write solely The Informer. There's probably four other writers who were just completely ghost writers, is what you'd be called and just complete uncredited and never acknowledge that they helped a huge portion of the film. Sometimes writers go in and drastically change a film, completely change act structures and completely change characters, but yet they're never credited to the final film, which you then go and see in theaters. Yeah, and that was certainly the case with Mutiny on the Bounty. Uh, Irving Thalberg, the producer of it, went to many lengths to have several writers outside of the ones that are credited, which is Jules, Jules Furthman, Talbot Jennings, and Carrie Wilson. Uh, there are several other writers that he did bring onto the project to add these minor things, bigger details, because he wanted to keep workshopping it. And some of that was to add more comedy to it. So yeah, there's a lot of uncredited aspects in many films, in almost every film that isn't mentioned and hasn't been mentioned in this podcast, but Dudley Nichols kind of stands up for the right thing and, and does what is good. Yeah, it's impressive. He he draws up really big conversation. It's it's a bold move to do, and especially to pull at a at a huge ceremony like this as the Oscars are growing and becoming a bigger thing. This is huge, and it probably only helped to find the Screenwriters Guild more and to find and respect the you know all these writers that are in the Screenwriters Guild. Best original story 
went to the scoundrel to Ben Hecht and Charles MacArthur. Uh, ben Hecht, uh, he's notable for writing Scarface, the 1932 movie, Wuthering Heights, Spellbound, Notorious, and he is uncredited for writing Gone with the Wind and the 1962 remake of Mutiny on the Bounty uh, to, to connect that to our Best Picture winner. And Charles MacArthur uh, was more of a frequent collaborator uh, with uh, with Hecht, and he co-wrote Wuthering Heights. Best Actress goes to Bette Davis as Joy Heath in Dangerous. This is Davis's first of two Academy Awards. She was nominated the year prior as a write-in, as we can remember. And it was a big to-do that she was not nominated in 1934. Yes, there was huge up in arms about how they had to write her in and that she wasn't even nominated in the first place. She would go on to be the first female to be nominated in five consecutive years and one of three actresses to be nominated ten or more times, most notably known for her role in the 1950 Best Picture winner All About Eve. Yeah, so what makes this win really interesting is it kind of brings up this question, is this a pity win for uh, for Betty Davis because she what didn't win the year before and everyone was so up in arms about it? Best Actor went to... Victor McLaglin for The Informer as Jeepo Nolan. So, in this Best Actor race for 1935, it featured Clark Gable, Charles Lawton, Franchot Tone, all three of Mutiny on the Bounty, and there was a write-in for Paul Muni in Black Fury. But, to carefully put aside Paul Muni for a second, the fact that there were three Three guys, three actors nominated for Mutiny on the Bounty, and none of them won, I think is bullshit. <laughs> because because there was no supporting acting category, which would be go on to be made the following year, probably as a direct result because of this. I want to see The Informer now, just because, one, it's now won a ton of awards over Mutiny on the Bounty, and it won over Charles Lawton, who, I again, I thought was such a great role. So I really want to understand, like, why the, why Victor McClaglin got it. And I'm sure he probably deserved it, but I think it's just so jarring to look at three guys nominated in the same category in the same movie and none of them win. It is so confusing to me. Yeah, it's definitely off-putting just because we're not used to seeing multiple names in the same category. And it's funny because this definitely led to the creation of Best Supporting Actor and Actress because of how just meticulous all the supporting roles were you know there there are supporting roles in this film but this is one of those troublesome films as we discussed that we can't really determine who's the lead actor who's the protagonist we certainly know who the antagonist is the 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 evil charles lawton uh or the evil captain Bly, but we're just kind of left in this ambiguous area for the rest of the the crew members i think we need to watch The Informer is what I think. Yeah, I, I definitely want, want to watch The Informer. And maybe we should have been more informed on The Informer heading into this. But part of the idea for this podcast is to look at the Best Picture winners as a collective just on their own and how they stand on their own two feet. And I th- I still feel like Beauty on the Bounty is a really good movie. So And especially Charles Lawton's performance. Now, would he have been the best actor nomination for the movie? I don't think I would have put him there. I think I would have put him as supporting actor. Um, and I probably would have put Clark Gable as the lead actor of the film, uh, just from how it, it all plays out. And I, and I just think it's just so disappointing that there was no best supporting actor for this year, because I think that at least one of those three guys would have gotten it that year. You know, And again, this takes nothing away from Victor, Victor McClaglin and the former. I'm just really interested to know like why out of all like out of three nominations for this movie, none of them got it. Best director goes to John Ford for the informer. Another one for the one. And you know, and again, we're not taking away from John Ford. He goes on to win three more best directors. He is, he, he has the most ever by any director is he the greatest director or one of the greatest directors of all time? Probably, yes. yeah. Like one, one of the greatest American directors yeah, of all time. Yeah, 100%. I, would, I now have to see The Informer because, and, I, and I'm not saying that Frank Lloyd did such an amazing job, but again, like we had this huge Hollywood production that so many people like that it's at the grandest scales of grand scales at the time in 1935. And yet it wasn't 
enough for him to win for best director. It's just, it's very odd. And I, I don't know what to make of it, but it, it has happened before in this early era of the Oscars that the best director and best picture don't necessarily match up. John Ford would go on to make Stagecoach, The Grapes of Wrath, The Quiet Man, and The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. And I think another thing probably to remember too is that Frank Lloyd did win Best Director for Cavalcade, so maybe that was another factor. But yet again, like they've already given multiple awards to other technical categories, so why not Best Director? Why is like a category like Best Director or Best Actor and Actress so taboo that like, oh, we can't really give someone a second award so close to another? Like, fuck that. If like they did a good job, they did a good job. So again, now this just really prompts me and John to watch The Informer and uh, in the second series of Worthy, where we go back and look at all these other movies, we'll talk about that. So for Outstanding Production or Best Picture for 1935, the nominees were Top Hat, Ruggles of Red Gap, Naughty Marietta, Les Miserables, A Midsummer's Night Dream, The Lives of a Bengal Lancer, The Informer, David Copperfield, Captain Blood, Broadway Melody of 1936, Alice Adams, and the winner of Best Picture of 1935 is Mutiny on the Bounty, produced by Irving Thalberg and Frank Lloyd for MGM. So before we give like our initial feelings about it winning Best Picture, two things. The first thing I wanted to talk about was Irving Thalberg. So Irving Thalberg was... A very it was a very prominent person at this time during MGM's uh, resurgence in the 1930s. This is his third Best Picture movie. He produced Broadway Melody and Grand Hotel. He became the head of production for MGM at the age of 26 in 1925, and he died 12 years later at the age of 37 because of pneumonia. He's one of the creators of the production code. Uh, Upon his death, Franklin. Uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, he said, the world of art is poorer with the passing of Irving Thalberg. His high ideals, insight, and imagination went into the production of his masterpieces, the Irving G. Thalberg Memorial Award, uh, which is given out periodically by the Academy since 1937 to producers whose body of work uh, are reflected consistently in high-quality films. He helped lead MGM during the Great Depression, and they became the only studio to show a profit during that time, and Thalberg is responsible for many practices in production, and um, one, a few of them are sneak previews for films and getting audience feedback and doing reshoots to fix that. So Thalberg is this like big name guy. He's this young guy. He's this huge creative mind that was really revolutionized a lot of the production aspects of film. And he died so young, unfortunately, but he did win three awards and the reason i want to talk about now was because he's going he does go on to die two years later and this is his last time where he's recognized by the academy so f- some initial thoughts from john i, I just want to know like, what your feeling is about upon learning about irving thalberg and more of his history and just how young he was uh, as a creative mind what jumps out to me the most beyond thalberg is that if you look at the overall nominations for Best Picture, you'll notice that MGM has included four out of the 12 nominations, more so than any other production company. Do you think that's uh, related to Academy ties? Yeah, it, it, it definitely is. It is 100% related to that. And to go back to another uh, New York Times article that came out uh, the day after the 8th Academy Awards, It says, amid this debate, members of the Screen Actors Guild and the Screen Writers Guild received telegrams from their executives yesterday urging them to remain away from the banquet, the Academy Awards. The messages charged the Academy is a producer-controlled organism and that the awards are made on the basis of producer politics. Academy heads hotly denied the statements and presented in rebuttal the fact that five of the six actresses nominated for Best Performances in 1935 are not members of the Academy. The sixth, Miss Hepburn, is is on the suspended list for non-payment of dues, uh, Donald Glenn Hill, executive secretary, said. So uh, this, I think, perfectly plays into today's politics of the Academy Awards, where they just deny, 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 and just be like, oh, well, look at this inclusivity of what we did. So this isn't a new thing, but the politics of the Academy is very much producer-driven and knowing who's who. And if you remember, hearkening back to our first episode of Worthy, 
one of the founders of Ampass is Lewis B. Mayer, one of the founders of MGM. And he, and literally he loved Irving Thalberg. Like they were partners and everything. You know, Thal- Thalberg was his right hand man on every single thing. So yeah, there is some favoritism to it. And what's even more interesting to, uh, to this is that all three of Thalberg's best picture winners won no other Academy Awards that year. And so Mutiny on the Bounty was nominated eight times this year and only won for Best Picture. And this is the last time that would ever happen where a Best Picture winner would only win just Best Picture. And it's just incredibly more interesting that it happens to the same producer all three times for the same production company that helped founded the Academy Awards. I don't know. I'm just throwing out just ideas out there. Put it together for what you would. But that's just how it is. Yeah, we're definitely seeing politics. It's definitely oh, yeah. <laughs> tied into some something a little shady going on. It's it's concerning when you see just how popular Informer is in every other category, and this film doesn't win anything in any other category. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know what to make of it. And um, it's, it is concerning, but it's what happened. It's, it's the history that we now have. Uh, so we are left with a best picture winner and that's mutiny on the bounty before we jump into the one and only question we ask on this podcast it's not true we ask a lot of different questions but hard. the question we ask on this podcast we got to go over some stats some numbers <laughs> yeah we do so mutiny on the bounty currently has a 93 percent rotten tomato uh percentage which is just the amount of reviewers who give it a fresh rating which is 93 percent of them very good and the average rating is an 8.57 out of 10. The audience score on Rotten Tomatoes is an 83%, and that is a 3.93 out of 5. The IMDb score is a 7.7, and it won no other awards besides Best Picture out of eight nominations. And then to give our numbers on the film, I gave the film a 87 Originally, it was a 95, but after the second viewing, I bumped it down a, to a strong B, B-plus movie instead of a strong, just A movie. What did you give it, John? I gave Mutiny on the Bounty a 65. Whoa! It sounds harsh, but it is my third highest review for all of the past eight films that we've watched. And personally, it really comes down to my preference. I just wasn't a big fan of this story. I thought it was pretty dull and could have been sped up and also just increased the tension and drama uh, with a name called mutiny on the bounty. I want to see that mutiny happen much <laughs> sooner. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with those uh, critiques of it. My score, I think has to do a lot with the time of when it was made. So at the time, this was like just a big grand scale movie and there's a lot going on with it. Charles Lawton. Again, i love that performance uh, of captain Bly. I think he knocks it out of the park. So I think that this movie really does stand up, though, still, compared to a lot of other Best Picture winners, and especially some other ones that came before it. So to me, an 87 is a good review for like really any movie. But for me, Best Picture winners should be a little bit higher. Uh, but I still felt like an 87 is a very strong score. So our averages right now out of the eight movies we've seen, I my average rating is a 70.3, and John's is a strong 60. So again, like, we're falling victim to some really poor movies at the beginning of this, namely the Broadway melody that brings down our scores, but we're still, we're going up and down and we're going to keep on doing that for another few movies. So John is mutiny on the bounty worthy of the best picture award of 1935. I say no. Wow. I, I have to say it was worthy of it. I think this is the first time we're disagreeing. I think it is the first time we're disagreeing. Wow. Actually, no, we didn't agree on Grand Hotel, I'm pretty sure. Oh, wow. That's just, I can't believe you would say that's worthy, but okay. <laughs> I, hey, I, I had something about Irving Thalberg, except for the Broadway melody. <laughs> I really like, I just, again, like this movie, it's definitely not for everyone, and it's definitely not a modern movie, but for people who are really into cinema and learning about the history of the Oscars and the his and seeing some just really interesting performances. Again, Charles Lawton's performance, you could get a kick out of this. You get a good insight into what blockbuster movie making was like in 1935. It was the bet. It was the highest box office movie of that year. It was the biggest budget of that year. 
And I think there's something just to be said for a Best Picture winner because sometimes those type of movies don't win that award. So I think it was worthy. I'm not going to say it's the greatest Best Picture winner of all time, but I think it was worthy of that award. I think the reason to watch this movie is because of Charles Lawton and his portrayal of Captain Bly. And I think that's clear from all the different remakes that we've seen. Five iterations of this movie exist. Another one is going to be coming soon, I imagine. So keep your eyes peeled. Yes, yeah, certainly. So that's it for this episode of Worthy. Thanks for listening. I'm Ben. And I'm John. And, and this, this is Worthy. worthy. I remember, sir, I should demand a court of inquiry in England. You mutinous dog. Retract that, sir. I will repeat it. You're a mutinous dog. Thanks for listening to Worthy, the breakdown of every Best Picture winner from past to present. Listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on Instagram at Worthy Podcast, on Twitter at Worthy Pod, and on Facebook at Worthy Podcast. Any inquiries can be submitted to Worthy Submissions at gmail.com. That's WorthySubmissions at gmail.com.